Well, good morning, one and all. It's good to be together, isn't it? <laughs> well, clearly not. <laughs> welcome, church family, and uh, welcome to, to anyone who's watching online. Um, it's a day of celebrations. Edwin's just told me that his, it's his birthday today, so happy birthday, Edwin. And... Uh, Liesl had her 50th birthday celebrations yesterday, so another special one. (laughs) And of course, today is Sunday, which is a special day anyway. It's a day we come apart to just recalibrate in a way, to reflect on who God is and who we are, and to get that into the right perspective. Remembering that God is almighty creator all-powerful, and that we're weak and fragile and much in need of him. That's the focus we get on a Sunday as we meet together around his word and meet together as his family. So it's special to be here because it's Sunday. But uh, what other day is it today? Do you children? (laughs) It's Mother's Day, isn't it? Joseph, Tommy, did you do anything for mummy today? (laughs) he's nodding (laughs) so today is mother's day and it's a great opportunity to say thank you to god for um, mothers in particular but not only that for those who care for us but I, i don't know whether you knew but the original mother's day was nothing to do with our earthly physical mothers it was to do with our mother churches And uh, I'm sure many of you will know this, but Mothering Sunday, the original title, was a a celebration, a Christian celebration, when people would go back to the mother church, the church they grew up in. And that would be an opportunity to say thank you to God as they look back on their lives for those people who had nurtured them in the faith and helped them to come to know Jesus and to grow in him. And uh, for some of you, put your hands up. Is is, um, GBC your mother church? Yeah, we got some at the back there, quite a few. Well done. (laughs) So you can look back and think of people through the years uh, in GBC who have loved and nurtured and cared for you and helped you to grow in knowing Jesus. Uh, For many of us, that would be somewhere elsewhere. But let's just have a moment, shall we, just to reflect on those people who've helped us to know who Jesus is, to come to faith. For some of us, we'll have a special person. Maybe it's a Sunday school teacher or um, a person in in our church who has walked alongside us and been very patient with us. And we can give thanks to God for that person, uh, all those people. Maybe it's just the, the fact of being in a loving church family. So let's just reflect and give thanks to God in our own hearts for those people who have helped us and maybe are still helping us very much on our journey of faith. Our Lord God, you never intended that we would walk through life alone. We praise and thank you for our mothers and those who have cared and nurtured for us through the years. Thank you for the sacrifices they've made, for the love and care that they've given us. But we also remember those for whom today will be a difficult and poignant day. Think of those who may be grieving hurting, disappointed, or angry on this Mother's Day. We pray that each one may be aware of your unfailing love and that we may all feel your presence closely today. Thank you too for the church families who have loved and cared and prayed for us for those who have modeled and introduced Jesus to us, for those who have taught us, guided us, and nurtured us in the faith. 
Father God, would you add your blessing to all those we know and are remembering now. And Lord, thank you on this Sunday that we can lift you up and thank you for your amazing love, your care for us, your guidance, your provision. Lord, what can we say but thank you from the bottom of our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing now. We're going to draw near to God. There's a lovely verse in James chapter 4 and verse 8, and it simply says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Come near to God, open, our, open your heart to him this morning, and he promises that he will come and meet with us. So we come to the one who is the almighty creator. We come in awe and reverence, but we also come to him who is father. And we can feel safe and secure in his arms. And the fact that he comes near to us shows how much he values us and loves us. So let's bathe in all those things today as we bring our worship to him. So I'm going to hand over to Paul. Good morning. Let's all stand together, shall we?
My life. 
Take a seat. Somebody's going to bring, just um, before, before the reading, let's just, just briefly pray. Father, do thank you for the opportunity to gather here as your church and celebrate you are a great God. We, uh, we thank you for, uh, for Carolyn, who's going to bring your word to us. We pray that you would bless her by your spirit, and uh, I pray that we will be attentive to the words that you want to speak this morning. Amen. Is it Sue who's coming to read the scripture passage? Okay. <laughs> this morning's reading is coming from Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 to chapter 9, verse 1. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spat on the man's hand eyes, sorry, and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death, before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, just to say that if you're in need of the crash, uh, it's not man today. Um, of the little ones, that is. <laughs> it's not man today, but it is available um, over in one of the rooms over there. It's nice and warm and the toys are out, so that's the important thing, isn't it? 
It's great to be singing those worship songs, declaring who Jesus is. And, um, you know, we've been singing so many, that second song, you know, refiner, shepherd, healer. I mean, packed full, isn't it, of who Jesus is. We just have to start to uh, believe those promises and, and live on them, uh, act on them. I don't know um, if we can have the first... You've probably seen these optical illusions before. Um, I don't know, as you look at this picture, what you first see. Uh, what you first see. Who's going to shout out? What can you see? A duck. Okay. Can anyone see anything other than a duck? A rabbit. Okay. <laughs> Who can't see either of those? <laughs> and you probably know this one as well, the next one. Young lady or old lady? Who saw the young lady first? Can everyone see the young lady? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. The young lady is actually looking away from us. And um, she's, her chin is what might be seen by others as the nose of the old lady. Can you see it yet? Isn't it interesting how we see things differently and how we can look at the same thing and see different things. There we go. We're having it pointed out to us. And sometimes when some things, if you can't see it, we'll put them on at the end and you can all point out things. <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't it, that when we point things out, we can get a whole new perspective and see something in a, in a, a totally new light. And that's the same with people, isn't it? Sometimes we get the wrong impression and somebody points out something and we can see them in a whole new light. And, I, and it's interesting too, I remember trying to point out this old lady, young lady thing in a school lesson once, and one of the children could not see, just could not, however much we pointed it out, could not see the young lady looking away. Uh, and it's interesting, sometimes we can be blind, even when things are pointed out to us. And today we're gonna to be thinking about Jesus's identity and in the passage uh, we read from Mark chapter 8, Jesus asks his disciples a question. He says, who do people say I am? And then he asks a more personal question. And what about you? Who do you say I am? I wonder how you would answer that question. How would you explain who Jesus is to somebody else? Who is he to you? Just a historical figure or more than that? But it's a really important question because who we think Jesus is will affect not only our life now, but the Bible says it will affect our view of who Jesus is, will affect our life after death as well, eternal life. So it's a very important question. And from early on in Mark's gospel, uh, lots of people have been asking the same question. Who is this man? Who is Jesus? And the crowds have listened to his wise and authoritative teaching, his verbal exchanges with the religious leaders. They've seen his healings and the miracles he's performed. And some have followed him just for the spectacle. But others have genuinely been seeking to discover if he is the Messiah they've long been waiting for. And as we come to this passage today, Jesus' disciples are still on a journey to fully understanding who Jesus is too. I haven't got time to go into all the details now, but the night that I came to know Jesus was an amazing night. As I say, I haven't got time to tell the whole story, but that night I saw a blind girl healed. She'd been blind from birth. And as the speaker of the evening prayed over her, her blind eyes were opened and she was able to see. You can imagine I was with hundreds of Christians at the time, but I happened to be standing next to this young girl. And uh, you can imagine the celebration as this young girl saw for the first time. A friend was with me that night, and he wrote a magazine article of what had happened. 
just after the girl had been healed, I'd seen the power of God in action. And I gave my life to following and loving the Lord Jesus straight away. And I gave my life to something that I've never looked back on. But uh, a friend was with me that night, and he wrote a magazine article, and he called the article, Blind Eyes See to the Glory of God. And in the article, he contrasted the blind girl's physical eyes being opened to my spiritual eyes being opened. It was an amazing evening. And to help us understand what's going on in the hearts and minds of the disciples, Mark here, he includes this account of the gradual healing of a blind man. He's the only gospel writer to record this incident. And although Jesus has healed a lot of people through his ministry, interesting, this, interestingly, this is the only account of a gradual healing. And the, the blind man's sight, as we read earlier, it's gradually restored from total darkness to the cloudiness of seeing people kind of looking like trees walking around, in other words, shadowy figures, to total sight. But there's a gradual realization there. There's a gradual opening of the blind man's eyes. And it's a fantastic metaphor for the gradual unveiling and realization of spiritual truth in the disciples and their growing understanding of who Jesus really is. It's a great metaphor for our own lives too. Someone on the Alpha course that we're running at the moment um, described to me the, uh, how she saw each of the sessions and she said, Week by week, it's like a window blind lifting up and the light coming in. And I thought, what an amazing metaphor that is, that just a little by little by little and the light coming in. And for the disciples, it's like as they spend time with Jesus, getting to know him, witnessing to, uh, to what he's doing, witnessing what he's doing, um, hearing his teaching, as he reveals himself to them, that it's like the blinds are going up. And, uh, but unlike the blind man here, they have yet to see clearly. And uh, we're told in the word of God that it's the, the devil who spiritually blinds us to who Jesus is and what he's done. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, the God of this age, that's Satan, the devil, has blinded the eyes of the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He blinds the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see. Satan does not want people to find freedom. He wants to keep us bound and in darkness. He doesn't want us to go the way of Jesus, to understand who Jesus is. But God loves every person. He longs that everyone should come to know him. And thankfully, he doesn't leave us in that predicament of blindness and dullness of understanding. By his Holy Spirit, he brings revelation to those whose hearts are open to him, and he lights up our understanding. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, But God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 13, For he, that is God, has rescued us from that dominion of darkness. And he's brought us, he has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. It's God being, bringing people from darkness into the light. It's all about him and his grace and his generosity. It's God's work. We, we can't, as we looked at the other week, we can't make that happen. We're simply called to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus, what we know of him and plant the seeds of truth. And it's God who makes those seeds grow and fruit. We need to persevere in prayer, though. We need to pray for those who don't yet know Jesus, asking that 
God will open their hearts, that he will bring revelation by his Holy Spirit. And those clouded minds will clear, those scales will fill, fall off eyes. That's something we can do each and every day. For two years, my Christian friends faithfully prayed for me and um, shared their faith with me. They told me that I had become, for two years, the prayer target of the Christian Union at the school. I didn't stand a chance, did I? I? I didn't always like what I was hearing as they shared their faith with me. I quite liked my life the way it was. And I often gave them the impression that I wasn't listening, that nothing was happening. But actually, I knew that bit by bit, God was opening my eyes and helping me see my need of Jesus and what he'd done for me. Now, some people seem to realize quite quickly who Jesus is once they've had the good news explained to them what Jesus has done for them, who he is. But for all of us, it's a process that takes time. And we shouldn't try to rush people into the kingdom. We can trust that God is at work as we pray, as we witness, bringing revelation, opening those blind eyes and drawing people to himself in his time and not necessarily in ours. We can be sure, as it says in Philippians 1.6, that God always completes the work that he starts. He never leaves things half done. Be encouraged if you're praying for friends or neighbors or family members. God is at work as we pray. You might not see anything. In fact, they sometimes say that, um, well, some people are very antagonistic, but they sometimes say that the most antagonistic people are actually the people who know that God's getting at them. <laughs> so be encouraged. As Jesus walks in the region of Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, he asks them this question to help them consolidate their thinking about him. Who do people say I am? And we know from Mark 6 that some people believe that, John, uh, that Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnated. And in fact, even King Herod, who'd had John beheaded, had taken on this belief. Others were recognizing him as a great prophet, which of course Jesus was. But that's not all he was. And then he really puts them on the spot. He says, who do you say I am? Now, I don't know. There might have been quite a lot of looking at the floor and shuffling at, at this point. Who do, who do, who's Jesus? Oh, I don't know. I remember in my French lessons at class in, in school, if I didn't want to, want to answer a question, I'd suddenly get my um, tissue out and start blowing my nose in the hope that I wouldn't be asked. But you can kind of imagine the disciple kind of, ooh. And Peter, who's often the spokesperson for the group, blurts out, doesn't he? You are the Christ. That's the Greek word in the Hebrew, the Messiah. Both of them mean the anointed one. The one the Jews had long been waiting for. Here he is. That's spot on. Peter's got it, hasn't he? Exactly who Jesus is. And this is such an important declaration from the lips of Peter, who will soon be so instrumental in leading and establishing the early church after Jesus' ascension. In the parallel passage, in a parallel passage of this incident in Matthew's gospel, Jesus replies to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. That's Peter. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now in the Greek, that, that, that word means little rock. It's a play on words here. I tell you though, you are Peter. You are little, the little rock. But on this rock, the word in the Greek is, means massive cliff of rock. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And Jesus acknowledges that Peter's revelation of, the, of his true identity has come from God. It's been a revelation from heaven. And it's on this revelation 
the recognition and confession of who Jesus really is, that God's kingdom will be built, is built. It's on that profession of faith, not on Peter, the little rock. It's on the big rock, the profession of who Jesus is. If you think about it, to come to Christ, we need to recognize who Jesus is. We need to profess him as Savior and Lord. I was in Israel many years ago, and uh, we went to a place called Benias. Some of you may, may have been there. It's now a beautiful nature reserve. And we're told in this passage that Jesus took his uh, disciples away to somewhere quite quiet for this encounter with them to ask this question. And uh, Benias is near Caesarea Philippi. And uh, it's believed that this is the place where Jesus may well have taken his disciples to have this dialogue. And right in the middle of the reserve is a very big cave with an underground spring. And the Greeks believed that this cave was the entrance to hell. And actually, the cave was known as the gates of hell. And people in the ancient world used to throw sacrifices into this spring at the bottom of this cave to appease the gods, so they thought, particularly the, the Greek god Pan, who was the god of vengeance. And Caesar and a number of other gods with small g's were also worshipped there. If Jesus was standing in the vicinity of this cave at Benias with its idol worship and sacrifices to false gods, you can imagine him pointing to himself first and then to the cave of sacrifices known as the gates of hell when he says, on this rock, on the profession of who I am, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Satan may try to distort and distract and deceive people into worshipping false gods and blind them from seeing who the one true God is, but he will not ultimately have the victory. He will not. Whatever he tries to do, he will never, ever thwart the plans and purposes of God. Know that for the people you're praying for. Know that for the people you're witnessing to. Satan cannot overcome the plans and purposes of God. The word hell here, the gates of hell that Jesus used, is the word Hades, the word for death. Ultimately, this is you and me, brothers and sisters, ultimately the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. Those who love and follow Jesus have eternity with him to look forward to. And Satan can never snatch that away from us. Jesus says that we're in, in his hand and Satan cannot snatch us. Isn't that good news? Wow. For a brief moment, the veil is taken away from Peter's eyes and he can see clearly who Jesus is. But then sadly, the fog settles again as Jesus starts to teach the disciples that the path ahead is going to be one of suffering. If you've got Mark chapter 8 um, uh, in front of you, you might like to look at that. Verses 31 to 32. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about that, this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is the first time that Jesus predicts his coming suffering and death. You can imagine, it must have been shocking for the disciples. And Peter doesn't like this idea at all. He's usually ready, gung-ho, ready for anything, isn't he, Peter? Whoa, get in there. But not suffering. Whoa, that's a different kettle of fish. He might understand who Jesus is, but he doesn't understand what the Messiah has come to do. And he takes Jesus aside. It's almost laughable, isn't it? He takes Jesus aside and starts to rebuke him. And maybe he's thinking that he will somehow protect Jesus from the suffering he's predicting. But whatever Peter said, it's clear he's thinking in earthly terms rather than Jesus, who's thinking in heavenly terms. Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, and then he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. 
you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. As Jesus listens to what Peter has to say, he recognizes a voice he's heard before. The voice of Satan in the wilderness at the start of his ministry, tempting him to bypass the cross. But Jesus' destination was always going to be the cross, wasn't it? That's why he came to this earth, to die, so that we might live. There is a green hill far away, without a city wall, where the dear Lord was crucified and died to save us all. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good. He died that we might go to heaven, saved by his precious blood. We're going to celebrate this in a minute. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. Only he, the son of God, the anointed one, only he could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. For the joy set before him, going to the cross was not a joy, but he was looking beyond the cross. What was that joy? The joy of seeing you and me with him for eternity. He looked beyond. He saw us with him, of being the gate for us to come to his father, of taking away our sins and seeing us made new and living as God always intended, of triumphing over sin and death and evil. That victory could only be achieved through his suffering and death. And nothing was going to stop him from taking that path. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. And this is the bit where the rubber hits the road for us. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? And what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. If we're to follow Jesus, there will be hardships along the way for us too. The kingdom life is not always easy. Sometimes we get disappointed and angry with God, don't we? But we almost hold him ransom for things that he never promised. He never promised a trouble-free life. We may experience persecution. Others may misunderstand us. They may ridicule us or even hate us for what we stand for. Many across the world, even now, are suffering torture and death for owning the name of Jesus. This is serious stuff. True discipleship is about following the way of the cross, the way of suffering. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. To take up our cross means to die. It means dying to living life our way, dying to following our own desires and motivations. We're called to follow our savior, Jesus, who suffered on our behalf and selflessly gave himself for us. We're called to lay down our life in service of him. Every minute, every day. Whatever that brings, whatever that service of him looks like. Suffering and all. To submit to God's will and to work to extend his kingdom. Forever, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. There's a paradox here, isn't there? It's in dying that we find life. It's in dying that we find life. When we give our life, we don't realize, we don't understand how this happens, but it's true. When we give our life to Jesus, he gives it back to us in abundance. The best life here and now and eternal life with him when we die. 
the blessings of walking with him, even through suffering, scripture tells us, are infinitely more valuable than anything this world can give. Matthew 6 tells us not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but to store up treasures in heaven, kingdom treasures. The things of this world might satisfy for a short time, but they cannot save us. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul, says Jesus? Well, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Many people chase after the things of this world, don't they? I did before I came to know Jesus. I had a different set of perspectives. I had a different idea of what was important. But how tragic, tragic to spend our lives amassing lots of stuff, which is here today and gone tomorrow, like a, like a bubble that you blow. And we don't give attention to the greatest need that we have, the need for forgiveness and reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. And Jesus has made both of these possible through the cross. Understanding who Jesus is and what he has done potentially changes everything. He offers the gift of eternal life, which starts now. And it's for us to take that gift and receive it and act upon it. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, says Jesus, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. One day, Jesus is coming again. And he will judge each heart. He'll judge where we stand with Jesus. There's a warning, though, here for those who are not willing to stand for Jesus. It's salutary stuff, isn't it? But conversely, the implication of this verse is that there will be an eternal reward for those who are not ashamed to be known as belonging to him. So who do you say Jesus is? Maybe you're still on that journey of faith still a bit cloudy in your understanding, well, I just encourage you to keep pressing on. Jesus says, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. Let's keep praying for our friends that the eyes of their hearts will be enlightened to understand who Jesus is and, the rev and his rev relevance to their lives. If Jesus is saviour and Lord to us, are we pressing on to love and serve him? Are we dying to ourselves? Are we reflecting more of the selflessness of Jesus every day? Are we making him known? Are we not being ashamed of him, but telling others, nailing our colors to the mast in our homes and our workplaces and our social spaces? It's challenging, isn't it? But let's let people know what Jesus means to us and what he could mean to them too. But praise God that he hasn't left us on our own to do all this. We have his Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit dwelling within to help and guide and empower us as we go. And we have the hope of eternity with him to look forward to. Praise God. And we celebrate all of this at this table, which we're going to do in a minute. So we're going to sing again. We're going to just reflect on the freedom that God brings us, our need to keep walking with him, but let's praise him as we sing. Amazing grace. I once was blind, but now I see. My chains have gone. I've been set free. Let's rejoice in all of these wonderful truths. Amen. Thank you.
Let's all stand together, shall we? <clears throat> Amazing grace, oh sweet is that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to feel, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending.
like to lift up your voice in prayer, then why don't you do that now? sense of handling, belonging, and being part of your people. Lord, increase our understanding of you. Increase our awareness of you. Increase our dependence upon you. 
that our eyes may continually open again to see those new truths that you want to reveal to us and that you are revealing to us and that you will reveal to us. Thank you. Amen. Holy and anointed one, Jesus, Jesus, risen and exalted one, Jesus, we praise you, Lord Jesus, you are at the right hand of the Father, interceding for your broken bones. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. We love you, we thank you that you have done everything that is needed to accomplish not only our salvation, but the whole world, Lord, you encompass with your love. Bring your salvation, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven, we pray at this troubled time, in your precious name. Yes. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And we're told before we take these elements that we should examine ourselves. That we should, we should come before our God and be real before him. Let's just take a few minutes just to bring our hearts to him. Maybe there are things that you have done or said, thought, maybe you've wanted to do life your way this week at some point. But we can be encouraged that those who come to him, he will forgive. And this is what this table is all about. So let's examine ourselves. Thank you, Lord. We receive your forgiveness. On the night of the Last Supper, we're told in Matthew 26 that while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup. He gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the, co the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The new covenant. The old has gone, the new has come. This is not about law. This is about grace. Those things we do not deserve, but God loves to give us anyway, just because he's a gracious, loving, and generous God. And he wants to lavish his riches on us today. Father, thank you for these elements. Thank you for what they symbolize and represent to us. Lord, forgive us when we just brush over the cross. When we got used to it, Lord, help us to come back and realize the agony, the torture, the sacrifice that you made for us. Thank you for your broken body. For me. Lord, thank you for that blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. That we can be clean and pure and fresh before you because of Jesus. We stand in his righteousness, 
his right standing before God, which he's cloaked around us. Father, thank you. May we take and eat and be so grateful. We love you, Lord. We want to follow you. Show us the way, we pray. And may we die to ourselves and live for you. Amen. This table is for those who know and love the Lord Jesus. You may only love him a little, but that's enough. He wants you to love him more. So come and eat and um, rejoice in what Jesus has done for you. We're going to pass out the bread. Um, do eat that as you receive it. Um, the worship team are going to sing to us and then we'll pass out the wine. But we'll hold on to the wine and drink together as a sign that we are Christ's body, his church, uh, together. Thank you. I think Anne and um, Helen are going to come and serve us. Could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery? Say, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple may divine for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table. By your grace, you are making us faithful. Lord, we remember you. And remembrance leads us to worship. And as we worship you, our worship. What? 
We respond in taking this bread and this wine, in remembering him, in remembering everything he's done for us, but also rejoicing in the fact that there's still a lot to come. So let's drink and be thankful. Father, would you light your light in our hearts? May we go with joy. Lord, may we go into this week knowing that you have us securely in your hand. Father, praise you. We glorify you. We magnify you. And thank you for all that Jesus has done for us. Thank you that we have the hope of eternity with him. Father, we adore you. Thank you. Amen. Normally at the communion table, we would pray uh, for those in need around the world. Amazingly, in January this year, um, a couple of gentlemen called Sam Cox and Alan Fro um, wrote a song. It was several weeks before the war in the Ukraine began, and it's a song we're going to listen to now. And it was written using verses from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. And uh, this psalm has since, since the war in Ukraine started, this, war, um, this psalm has since become a focal point all over the world for people praying for the Ukrainian situation. And yet this song was written in January this year, before the war even started. Uh, the song uh, was recorded in um, English and Ukrainian. And uh, we're going to listen to it now. And as we do so, I suggest that in the quietness of our own hearts, we pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for those in desperate need. We pray for those who are in his church, God's church, our brothers and sisters. And maybe at this communion table as well, you've recognized your own need of God's touch today. So know the words of this psalm for yourself as well as it plays. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the people. And maybe as we sit here quietly, others come to mind who need the touch of God too. Pray over them these words. There's nothing more powerful than praying scripture over people. The truth of scripture that they might be still and know that he is God. So let's pray for God's peace, his encouragement, his comfort and his provision as we listen to this beautiful song. Spoken in
Loving God, as we see the brokenness of our world, we pray for healing among the nations and for individuals, for food where there is hunger, for freedom where there is oppression, for joy where there is pain, that your love may bring peace. Amen. I've been given a short prayer, which I'd like to pray with you. Lord, we know that when we walk through times of trouble and sorrow, 
you walk beside us. But all too often, Lord, we forget that in those times of trouble and sorrow, we can take them to you. We can leave them at the foot of the cross. We can lie in your grace, Lord, so that we can truly know the meaning that all things, whether good or bad, work together for those of us who love you, Lord. Amen. We're going to finish our service with a wonderful song of surrender. Um, surrender back to God as we go out into this new, fresh week to serve him. Let's stand and we'll close with this. You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now understands You stood before my failure And carried the cross for my shame Sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what could I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely. May we live this week to the full, being true to God in every way. 
May we give ourselves away to others, show, showing the kindness and compassion of Jesus to everyone we meet. And may we love the lost and proclaim Christ in all we do and say. Go to serve him and love him and rejoice in him as you go. And uh, if you would like uh, prayer, then you can come to the front row here. The cameras will be turned off. We would delight to pray for you. Pray God's blessing on you. Pray for your need. Um, we do have opportunities to give if you would like to. Um, there are baskets um, over there and at the front door as well. Um, there are refreshments available. Do go through to the room through there. You can bring your teas and coffees through here again. And um, just a reminder, too, that we do have prayer meetings, 8 o'clock on a Wednesday evening on Zoom. Uh, do get in touch with the church office if you would like the um, link for that. And also in person at God Manchester Baptist Church at 8 o'clock in the morning. So um, those of you who could be there. Fridays. Yeah, thank you. So... Enjoy your week and look forward to being together next week. The best